Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Great Backend Engineering Podcast. In this podcast, we have Johnny Dallas from Alati. So Alati is a platform that helps you monitor your um, backend systems. Anyways, we're going to talk about that. But for now, I want Johnny to introduce himself and give us a little perspective into what he has been doing with engineering. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be out with you today. Um, like you said, I'm Johnny Dallas. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Alerty, um, as well as the co-founder and CEO of Zeet. Um, Alerty is a, a monitoring platform helping you to monitor your various applications and infrastructure, help you find out about all the issues you might have, um, and Zeet's a cloud deployment platform. Um, I've been a backend engineer for the last eight years now, now a founder building tools for backend engineers. and. Uh, uh, I've done everything from front end, full stack, back end, uh, infrastructure, SRE, from startups to companies like AWS. So excited to talk about, you know, what does it look like to do good observability and how do we make a, you know, great back end engineering decisions. Thank you very much for that. Um, all right. So this podcast is sponsored by Alati and Alati helps you cache issues before they actually affect your users. So if you've been building APIs, you understand that it's important that you plug in some monitoring tools that helps you check if your systems are up to running or if they are having errors or whatever is happening behind the scene of your system in production. And that is where Alati comes in, helps you monitor all that. We are going to talk about it in great details, but for now, let's get started with the podcast. So, Johnny, I have a few questions for you, and I hope, hope you help us address these because backend engineers all over the world are looking to learn from your experience. Now, the first question starts with how far can a solo developer scale? Now, this question is related to people or engineers that are working for companies and sometimes they want to build something on their own, right? So, how can they scale? And at the same time, even when you're building your backend systems, how can you scale your backend systems? Right? So let's start um, with that discussion. Yeah, it's a it's a good question, and I I appreciate the way you've raised it too. Of uh, you know, if you're an engineer in a big company, you're probably used to having other engineers you're working with. You're probably used to having you know product team, internal tools, the design team. You have all these resources around you that. Um, however much you realize it, are, are supporting you in, in building whatever your project is. And uh, we all love side projects. I, uh, I, I think every company I've started has, has come out of a side project. Um, but uh, doing things on your own is a very different world. Um, it's quite a bit more that you have to take on yourself. There's quite a bit different, you know, posture and stance towards buying tools versus building tools. What technologies do you use? How do you manage everything from one person? Um, and I think what's been really interesting, especially right now, and especially over the last few years, you see more and more solo devs able to do more and more things. Like there's all these AI tools now that help you write code faster and more efficiently and, you know, debug issues. Uh, a few years ago, those didn't exist. It'd take a lot more work to, to build something on your own. But um, to your question, how far is a solo dev scale? I think a solo dev can scale quite quite far, honestly. Um, of I've seen lots of solo devs that if you choose the right tools, you can write all the code. You're you're a smart person. You're an engineer. I'm sure you can build a build a backend. Um, you can leverage tools if you're not a big design head to figure out the front end and, and design something up and get it out there and, and find some easy way to deploy it. Um, yeah. But I think where solo devs start to break down is one when the product gets too big uh, when there's lots of different areas that need kind of constant attention or when you didn't think ahead and you didn't invest enough in internal tooling um uh -huh. it's like in that first case I've, I've built solo side projects and had a few friends start to use them and i'm really excited about we're going to go and add this feature xyz it's going to make the platform so much better and meanwhile they're emailing me about, hey, can you make it so I can uh, delete my user? Or can you fix this bug on the settings page? And mm -hmm. it's not nearly as important to me. I, I want to build the kind of, you know, the roadmap, um, make the product better. But serving the user is so important that I end up having to spend a lot of time on these 
smaller tasks. And that's when, you know, maybe there's enough interest behind this. Maybe there's people using this enough that actually you should find somebody to help you with it. And then that, that second example of internal tooling, I can't tell you the number of times that I've, I've built something and I do it manually once or twice or three times or many more than three times. Um, and then I, I realize as we as we continue having people try this or I continue adding features, this just isn't going to scale. I'm a really big fan of building internal tooling and, and building automation to help you with your day-to-day -day development tasks. Uh, Solidus just spent a lot of time there. Yeah, so like you rightly said, um, sometimes as engineers, we like to think as engineers, right? We want to build everything ourselves and we think uh, that's the best way, <laughs> but it's really not. So using tools, even while you have an idea to build as a solo, solo developer, you have an idea of something to build and you might want to reinvent the wheel and build it your own way, right? That is the thought of every engineer, but sometimes using external tools, you know, that are already out there that solve the problem um, would help you a long way in terms of scaling that product that you're trying to build. Thank you very much for sharing that. And we have another question, <laughs> which is going to drive up deeper to the topic of today. So the topic of today is mainly related to monitoring and observability, right? But before we even get to that part, we need to kind of um, lay a foundation where all this is starting from, right? So the next question is, what is DevOps and why do we need it, right? So I, I want you to help me break down what DevOps is all about for backend engineers, right? Because we are used to, as a backend engineer, um, I think we are mostly focused on building the best business logic of any system. And uh, when, when you think about deployment, for example, in a big uh, company, when you think about deployment, it's been like handed over to different persons, right? So I want you to help us break down these DevOps um, concepts and help us tell us why it's actually important for backend engineers. Yeah, and it's a it's a good question. I think it ties nicely into what you were saying a moment ago. Of um, you're totally right. There's so many tools out there. You should you should leverage them. I think DevOps is about. I mean, the, the the name breaks down quite easily of developer operations, right? It's all of those things that you as a developer have to do that are, I guess, not writing business logic. Um, and there's a lot. There's a lot of things that you have to do. You have to write tests, yeah. you have to make sure that your uh, packages are up to date, you have to make sure that you're not introducing vulnerabilities into that new business logic. You have to, you know, like you said, deployment is a big piece. You have to make sure once you are deployed, how is your system performing? Is it doing everything you wanted it to? Are the logs uh, healthy? Is there a bug that you didn't know about? Is there an edge case you didn't know about? Is everything able to communicate mm -hmm. with each other? There's a lot of work that goes into, you know, running an actual backend system. Um, yeah. Simply um, I think DevOps sometimes gets a bit of a, a bad rap because it's uh, a lot of some some backend developers can say that's not my job. You know, DevOps is is something that the infrastructure team does or the SREs do or that's over there. But especially mm -hmm. in the context of you know a, a solo dev or if you're working on a project outside of your usual team and your usual structure, DevOps is super important. Yeah. It's a, it's about what are the things that you're doing to build your 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 backend that you can automate away that you can simplify for yourself everything from you know getting logs and metrics and then visibility into how's your system doing um yeah. to making sure that you don't push bad code out um something as simple as that and there's mm -hmm. so many off the shelf tools um that allow you to to have some structure and some framing to do devops tasks um some of them public and then kind of well-known, like, you know, GitHub Actions, I think is a, a great general tool that has come out in the last, there has gained popularity in the last few years of run arbitrary scripts on every commit. Um, super helpful way to just know every time I push a commit, it's going to run a build or it's going to run this check, that check, and tell me what the status is. Um, yeah. But DevOps is really about make sure that you're doing your job as effectively as possible um, beyond just writing the business logic, because there's a lot more than that that you might be being shielded from. Exactly. So I, I, kind of, I kind of love how you put that. The aspect where you said, you know, DevOps basically helps you do your job effectively. It's really nice because when you write this system, when you write this business logic, it is not complete, except it's being, you know, 
take it to the hands of the users and the users actually use them right so if you are writing business logic and it's not in the hands of the user that means it's not complete and devops actually helps you do that you know there are lots of tools from deployment to monitoring to actually seeing everything that is happening on the system when it is out of your hands like when it is from out from development to production you know devops actually kind of helps in that aspect and it is a good thing for marketing engineers to actually you know look into learning devops as well there's this uh, yeah. there's a classic trope, right, of a uh, backend engineer who says, you know, it works on my machine, right? It, I don't know what you're talking about. It, the code works fine on my computer. Um, it must be perfect. This is where DevOps comes in, right? Even tools like containerization technologies like Docker enable you mm -hmm. to solve some of that. Uh, having CICD that's running tests and doing linting um, not on your machine solves some of that. I love the way you said it. If it's not in front of the user, it's not done. Um, <laughs> writing good code on your computer. Okay, great. I'm happy for you, but let's get it out. Let's let's make sure it actually works. Exactly, exactly. All right. So I have another question. I am still big on you know talking about tools and most importantly the tools that helps backend engineers to actually succeed or take their whatever they are building to the hands of the users. And I want to ask this question, right? So why does internal tooling actually matter, right? So when we have, when we, when we are building a system, we're talking about maybe solo developers or maybe people working in the company, right? When we are building a system, does it really matter if we use internal tools or if we use external tools, right? Is there any benefit for using internal tool or why, why does internal tool really matter? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think a lot about internal tools and I, I talk a lot about them. Um, maybe just to, to start there, a little bit of kind of how, how I define them or how I, how I think about that distinction, because I think you made a, a clear line between internal tools and external tools. I think that um, sometimes people think, think about internal tools just as software they write themselves to do DevOps tasks, right? Like. I built my own CI/CD server for whatever reason, or I built this crazy internal application that's an admin portal. That's what they think of as internal tools. I think that's those certainly are internal tools, but um, most of the DevOps type tools that are out there, like GitHub Actions, we called out earlier, or even some of the products that I've contributed to building, um, you make them your own. That's how they. That's how you use them effectively, right? you turn GitHub Actions into a set of workflows. And those workflows, I would argue, are internal tools. Like those are yours. They're specific to your workflow. They're specific to how you build. And they're really just like, um, you know, codifications of how does your team operate or how do you as a developer do your job? Um, and I think it's extremely, extremely important to have automation like that, to build those internal tools, whether it's, you know, from scratch or leveraging existing public tools, um, because it's just the only way that you're going to remember what you're doing um, and let alone yeah. scale to other developers on your team. Exactly. So I think I have um, a little experience I want to share around this topic. So um, for Mastering Backend, it's a learning management system, but I didn't want to view the, shall I say the admin backend where I have to add the courses and stuff. So I am using Retool, so there's this platform Retool. So I'm using that to kind of manage my admin system. You know, add courses, add whatever I want to add or stuff like that. So can that be considered an internal tool since I didn't build Retool myself? <laughs> yeah, I'd say that you didn't build Retool as a platform, but you went in and you built a dashboard out of Retool, right? You hooked it up to your database or to your API or to your tooling. And now that dashboard is your internal tool. It's a tool that helps you do your job. Um, the fact that you built it using an external platform is kind of just like a implementation detail. It's like you use, you know, React versus Vue. That doesn't matter too much to the end user. Oh, right. So yeah, I know it doesn't matter to the end user, but talking about backend engineers, now that sound like um, competence or not competence to be able to not build your own kind of. Um, admin dashboard or not build your own kind of internal tool to help you solve your problem. Not, in terms of competence, competence to a backend engineer, what would you say around that? I, I, 
I measure competence in terms of uh, getting the job done. Um, I think that if you're using something like Retool, it's easier to maintain. You've got automatic security updates. You've got all these built-in pieces. You're probably going to build it 10 times as quickly. And so that would certainly, uh, you know, not not raise any red flags if it were on my team. Um, <laughs> nice, nice. So just like, for example, if you want to do monitoring and observability, you are building your own dashboard for for logs and then reading your own dashboard for all the charts and graphs that you're going to be presenting. So I'm using alerts. That's that sounds <laughs> that really sounds like a lot of work actually. Exactly. <laughs> I I can right. I can share a, a similar story actually there about uh you know two companies that I worked at that uh, had kind of different levels of internal tooling. Um when I when I started my career uh, I started quite young. I started working at a startup when I was about 14. Um and when I joined the company, we had a couple of different people doing DevOps and it was a little bit scattered. We didn't really have very consistent tooling internally. There was a, a script here and a script there and we kind of learned how to massage everything together to make a deployment happen. Um, but over the course of the startup, we, you know, we grew, we had more and more people using us. We had more and more interest from our, our product and what we were building. And we got to a point where we were deployed only in one region. We were deployed only in US West 2 on AWS, but we had to go to every region in AWS. So we had to go from one region to, I think it was 16 regions that were available at the time. Um, and we were like, shoot, how are we gonna do this? Some of this infrastructure has been here for like five, six years. We don't actually know how we made it in the first place. And we kind of had a fork in the road. We were like, hmm, do we go and study the existing infrastructure and figure out how we made it and try to do our best to recreate that somewhere else? and mm -hmm. hope that it doesn't break and hope that we and in that process we'll figure out how it all works uh because the guy who all built right. it was only about the company or do we just kind of uh build something new and start from scratch um we ended up starting from scratch to a degree but with an important detail which is we only allowed automation to create our infrastructure uh mm -hmm. we built basically an internal tool on top of Jenkins and Terraform and a couple other existing, you know, public technologies that made it so our CTO could click a button. And when he clicked that button, mm -hmm. it would spin up an entire new AWS region, spin up all of the servers that are needed to bootstrap a region, connect them all together, deploy the first version of all of our services and mm -hmm. just instantly be running. At the same time, that system made it so any of our application developers, any of our front end or back end developers could define a JSON file that said, here's the environment variables I need, here's the start command, and just push that to GitHub, and it would deploy to each of those new regions. And just like that, the kind of combination of existing public tools built a really powerful internal deployment platform that let us go from one AWS region and like, I think we had 10 EC2 instances to 16 AWS regions and over a thousand EC2 instances without hiring an infrastructure team or without hiring an SRE team. It was just the power of one software developer building this platform can go, can scale the company so much faster, can scale the product so much faster because of having this internal tooling. It was, it was a massive change in the, you know, scale and quality of life for everybody involved. And I think that that's a great example of just how powerful internal tooling can be. Awesome. Awesome. So at the end of the day, I think it's more about getting the job done. You know, getting your product as quickly as possible to the to the end users. That's that's all what it is. Okay. So whether you're making use of internal tool and you are able to quickly do that, you know, kind of get your product to the end user, or if you can use external tool, whatever you use, and you get the job done. I think that's really what's important. Okay, so for backend engineers out there trying to kind of reinvent the wheel or feeling like since they didn't build the, the backend themselves, they don't have enough competence. That's that's not true. All right, so you actually have enough competence for even discovering to use an, an external tool that solves um, your problem quicker. Okay, so thank you very much, Johnny, for, <laughs> for helping us summarize this. And I have another question. Now, why does CIC matter? So it, throughout our discussion around the internet, so we're talking about CIC somehow pipeline and stuff, but I want to now know why does it really matter? And why is deployment so complicated this time? <laughs> yeah, 
Um, so CICD is extremely important, I think, and it's a great, it's, it was one of the first places that people think about uh, internal tooling, or I think one of the first places that internal tooling gets helpful um, in even a small project. CICD is really about every time you're pushing commits, every time you're pushing changes to whatever your version control system is, GitHub or, or something else, uh, how do you constantly validate and ideally deploy those changes? So the CI and CD and, and CI/CD is continuous integration, right? It's all about you know run tests, run lints, run uh, checks to make sure that the code that you're pushing it passes your rules and is allowed to be deployed. And then CD is really about actually making that deployment happen every time you push and doing it safely. Um, I think it's extremely important to do this because it provides a, a, a common layer of you can't say it works on my machine if it's always being built on the build machine. If you have a friend join you on a solo project or you hire a new engineer on your team at a, at a bigger company, um, they already see how everything works. It's visible to them. There's not some esoteric scripts on your laptop or your computer that they can't see. They know that they're using the same systems. Uh, so it just you know, evens the playing field, makes it easier to onboard. Um, and it allows you to just move that much faster. It means that you're not going to have to, to babysit every build. You can just focus on the core of your job, which you know is writing that business logic that hasn't gone away. It's just CICD helps you automate away some of the tasks that are on the on the on the edges of, of writing the business logic and actually getting that out. Awesome. So, <laughs> so it gives me a kind of a perspective around um, CICD. The aspect where you see, you know, it helps you automate your tests helps you automate your build system, right? That's really great. Because I think that's part of a developer's job, right? To write test and to make sure that it works, not just working on your local system, but also working on production. That's really important. And the delivery yeah. part, that the CD part helps achieve that, that it actually works in production, okay? So CISD is really, is really important. But I want to also know why is deployment complicated? Because now we have new <laughs> <laughs> now we have uh, this whole DevOps movement, which is really great that it makes deployment very fast. So you can build and deploy in the next few seconds, which is awesome. Before it wasn't like that, we have to plan a sprint or kind of, you know, plan a long time to build and then use a long time to deploy. But now it's faster. But does it, see, does it mean that now it's complicated? <laughs> because you have to write a whole lot of code to deploy. <laughs> okay, yeah. so what do you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Deployment's quite complicated. Um, well, deployment can be quite complicated. It doesn't have to be. But uh, I think the core of why is it complicated is because every business is different. Um, there are some businesses, there are some teams that I've worked at where we are trying to ship 14,000 commits a week. You know, we're, we're just constantly updating production, constantly shipping changes, constantly going out. Um, there's other teams, different products where it's extremely important to never break prod. You can't mess up. Uh, maybe you're building mm -hmm. tax software. Maybe you're doing something mission critical. Uh, maybe you're you're doing healthcare and you know lives are at stake. You cannot break prod. In that case, you see release schedules where you know lots of changes will go in, and every month or every quarter, a really well tested version of the software will be released, and everyone can go update it. There's also a question of, you know, who are your customers? If you're building a SaaS application where, you know, everyone's going to your website, going to your API, you have a lot of control over the environment. And so it's easy to fix a mistake if you break it. You know, you can push out a new change, you can update the configuration, but maybe you're working with the government um, and they have on-prem machines that you can't touch. And so if you break it, you have they are going to email you and you have to send them a new update and tell them the commands to run and that's much harder to coordinate it takes more of your engineer time it takes more of their time maybe they get, get mad at you in the process it's just harder and so there's there's a lot of different kind of um environments and i mean that beyond just production and like staging there's a lot of different ways that you can deploy and places you can deploy to um yeah. i think that's a big piece of it. There's also a nuance around, we've gotten much more advanced in doing safe deployments over the last few years. I think DevOps was really about, can we do more deployments faster, push out changes faster and have dev and ops, which used to be different teams, uh, tied closer together. 
doing that requires good internal tooling and good automation and good good rules um but there's things like rolling deploys of rolling out to a percentage of your servers and checking is that or serving your users effectively before you roll out to the rest of them or blue green deploys where you spin up a whole new environment route a little bit of user traffic to it and then swap over if it's if it's looking good uh canary deployment mm -hmm. similar there's lots of different deployment strategies and if you're at a crazy scale and you've got twenty thousand servers to deploy to it's going to take some time you need some rollbacks in there you need exponential backups if you can't reach a, a a host there's a lot of complexity it's its own engineering system just like your business logic yeah so i think from what you just said i think deployment is better now than before much better now <laughs> <laughs> and it keeps getting better be better now because um i built lots of um simple projects uh, myself i'm I, I do indie hacking also so i build like small small projects and stuff and it takes me seconds to actually deploy features once maybe someone said something on, on Twitter or on LinkedIn, oh, one thing is not working and I, I checked it is not really working. So I go fix it, push it to Git and it's deployed. Okay, I just go back immediately and tell the person is working now, right? So that is possible now, but it wasn't possible before. We ha I have to, before now, before DevOps and the entire deployment um, upgrade, I have to plan that. And I even have to use a file if I was, you know, if I was doing, I was doing PHP back then. So I have, I have to use a file, um, this platform called FileZilla, right? So FileZilla mm -hmm. to actually upload the new changes <laughs> and stuff like that. So I think deployment is better now and it's faster, right? But then the complexity starts to happen when you start building bigger systems, right? And when you start having some kind of restrictions you know, uh, for deployment, we start having restrictions. Like, as you said, for some critical systems, production, you cannot break production, right? So it is it is a rule that you cannot break production. So there are lots of things that happen for you not to break production, right? You know, we, you have to set up QA, QA system or QA team to actually thoroughly test everything and make sure it's working according to plan. And that delays a little. Right, but it's still better than before. <laughs> okay, so thank you yeah. very much for that for that insight, and it's it's really awesome. So now let's go down to the monitoring and observability part of the conversation, right? So let's start with what is monitoring and what is observability, and why are they even important? Okay, so let's start by you know giving a groundbreaking discussion around this stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I really appreciate what you said a minute there of, um, you know, you can't break prod. And like you said, there's lots of things that go into that. I think monitoring and observability are really focused on that same idea of how do you not break prod, but also how do you know that you didn't break prod? Um, it's easy to say a build went out, my code is perfect, I'm all good, I'm going to go to sleep. But in reality, production is a scary place. There's a lot of people who are doing weird things to your servers. There's a, a lot of external factors you can't control. And monitoring and observability give you a way to know about the things going on. So um, observability, I think, is a, is, a, is a big word that people throw around a lot. But at the core, observability is about um, how do you get a sense of the internal state of the system by monitoring its external outputs. Um, mm -hmm. For example, uh, a common observability use case is looking at the CPU or memory or, or uh, host metrics for your servers and determining from that, is your application getting bottlenecked, right? If your CPU is constantly at 100% utilization, hey, you might be serving requests lower than you expect to because your CPU is getting throttled. Um, monitoring is a little bit different, but similar. It's about how do you go in and, and, and look at some of these different metrics? Uh, I think we will talk about external monitoring quite a bit, which is how do you ping your systems from some other systems and check, are they doing what they expect to do? And if they're not, tell you about that. Uh, if they're not, send you a text, send you an email, send you an alarm, trigger an incident. There's a couple of different ways that people do this, but um, fundamentally monitoring and observability are both about how do I make sure my system is up and performing as well as possible 
uh, no matter what's happening to it. Uh, and that's extremely important to make sure that you're not breaking prod and to make sure that you're delivering the best experience to your users that you can. Nice. So this is this is this is great. Like the breakdown is is awesome. So from what you've said, I can actually just pick out a few things and try to um, talk about it. So observability is more like um, having an investigative approach towards discovering things that may be going wrong in your system. So if something happens, you know you try to investigate, right? Try to go to the traces. Try to go to the logs. Try to find out, try to replay and find out what really happened, right? And then maybe you see a possible solution because once you have a problem, <laughs> once you understand the problem, then the solution is just there staring at you, right? So that is observability. And then monitoring is more like uh, generating reports and things that are going wrong. If something is happening, you know, if something is going to happen, you actually know. Okay, so that makes that makes a whole lot of sense, right? And in terms of why they are important, okay, it is already clear that they are very that they are very important because in a real production environment, things go wrong. You know, um, things actually break. That's the truth of the matter. No matter how good your program is, no matter how good your code is, at some point it's going to break because you can't control what users are actually doing. The users. Some of them can be good guys, some of them can be bad guys, you know, sending a lot of <laughs> threats to your system. <laughs> and you need to know, and that's where monitoring comes, comes to play. Awesome one, all right? So, <laughs> so let's talk about how do you actually monitor a web app, a web application. So this web application can be API, right? Your backend system, which is actually your business logic. How do you monitor it? Now let's go deeper into this. Let's talk about some tools that we can use to monitor our web apps. Since we now know that it's very important to monitor them. Yeah, well, uh, um, I, you, you hit the nail on the head there. I think it's, you know, all, why is this important? This is all about make sure you're serving your users, make sure you're actually up if you think you're up. Um, and when we talk about web apps, you know, there's a couple of different ways things can break. Uh, it's easy to think about, you know, I pushed a bug. Um, I pushed code and now my API endpoint 500s when it shouldn't. Um, I think that's that's one big case. You want to know if that's happening, right? Is your is your is your business logic broken? Um, there's you know a layer down. There's my application doesn't work at all. Like it doesn't start up. Uh, there's a syntax error. There's a there's a uh, issue preventing a missing environment variable. There's something preventing the server from starting in the first place or serving any traffic. Uh, you would want yeah. to know if that got to prod because that means nobody's going to be able to do anything. Um, mm -hmm. There's also, you know, like you said, things out of your control. Uh, I, when I've in the past managed big fleets of AWS instances, um, every so often there's one of them that just doesn't work randomly. The, the hardware fails. That happens. There's a mm -hmm. fundamentally, there's mechanical pieces underneath all of this. Um, sometimes a server breaks and it doesn't serve traffic anymore. And you did nothing wrong. It's just bad luck. Um, there's yeah. the, you know, crazy bad luck of you know a solar flare fits flips a bit in your in your code and everything works differently. You, you never know what happens. There's a lot that's out of your control. Yeah. Um, but I think for web apps, there's probably two places that are important to start, and there's a lot more that you can dig into, of course. Uh, the first I'd say is error tracking, um, making sure that you know. If your code is reporting errors, making sure that that is visible to you in some central place or some database or some repository where you can actually see all the things breaking is extremely important. There's a number of tools that are really great at helping with this. Uh, the tool that we've built, alerty.ai, um, has you know support for this natively, but I think there's also tools like Sentry is really popular here of uh, natively ingest every time an error happens, show it to you. Um, so you can go and fix it in your next, next push. The good thing about that is it tells you if somebody is using your product wrong, but the bad thing about error of tracking is it doesn't actually tell you about some of these more fundamental failures. If your code can't start up because the machine isn't actually launching your, your program, there's no there's nothing to report the errors. It's not going to have a, a, a trace back. It simply didn't start but your users are still gonna experience a downtime instant. That's where I'd say external monitoring for a web app 
is really important. This is the idea of have some other server or some other system somewhere that you don't control or you don't own trying to access your server the way that a user would. Because if they can't, somewhere along the way, something's broken. Maybe it's the networking level, mm -hmm. maybe it's the infrastructure level, maybe it's the application level, maybe it's the host level, maybe it's your code level. But external monitoring tells you something's broken somewhere. And so every time I start a new project, whether it's a side project or a company project, uh, one of the first things I do is I go and find a tool to every minute or every few seconds, hit my website and just make sure it's up, make sure it's responding with traffic. Because if it's not, mm -hmm. something's wrong, I need to dig into why. And maybe there's a blind spot that I didn't know about of a thing that could break. Awesome. So, <laughs> so this, is, this is awesome. So I have experience of uh, building one application like that content that basically so um for i think it went down for like, for like five days <laughs> right <Really? laughs> so, I, <laughs> so i've been receiving mails of users complaining of the app not opening it's working for me i don't know i don't know how to describe that so it's working for me i think it's because um the platform is cached on my system or whatever. So when I log in, <laughs> so when I, I try them, it's working. So basically, I cannot reproduce the error. So I will feel like the user is not experiencing that, and I will just not bother much. But it was really down for five days. So I I had to go check because I I kept, I kept receiving the bills. So I had to go check my you know infrastructure. A monitoring system that I set, set up and I noticed that it's been showing red for like five days. <laughs> okay. So that was when I got to fix it. But talking about from the angle that you are talking about, right, there are lots of things that could cause a system to break. For example, infrastructure could be one and people focus a lot on that. Another thing is application itself. Like you said, mm -hmm. some errors that you might introduce, some bugs that you might introduce. That is one. But what about if your database server is down? <laughs> right. So that's not going to some some platform is not going to capture that because the user will still be able to assess at some point. Maybe you have a, a few different databases connected. Some user will still be able to assess and some user might not completely. For example, someone that is trying to log in, right, might not really be able to log in. But if somebody is already logged in, right? The person has still try to refresh that page and then we'll be getting errors and stuff like alerts and, and stuff. But is there a system that you can set up to monitor specific, you know, things that talk to your application? What I mean is, can you set up monitoring for your database, right? Can you, can you set up monitoring for your infrastructure, if it is down or not? Can you set up monitoring for your code, like your API, your business logic itself, right? Is that possible yeah. or is there one tool that basically does everything for you out of the blue? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think uh, um, it's a good, it's a great question. And, you know, your example there of, uh, you know, the system was down for five days and you were cash, so you didn't know. Um, that's why we have external tools. That's why we have external monitoring, because the point of them existing is you can trust them. You know, they're not biased. Um, they don't have all of your local development and your cache and everything like that. Uh, if it says it's down, it's that's pretty real. Something is down. Um, and you make a great point. You know, we're talking right now about, you know, URL endpoints and making sure that the site responds with traffic, but it could still be broken. There's, there's lots of dependencies. I think that monitoring all of your dependencies is extremely important. Databases are a big and, and, and great example, um, but even other third-party dependencies, like maybe you're using, maybe you're building a new AI application and you're relying on the OpenAI API. If OpenAI is down, so are you. It's not your database, it's not your website, but if OpenAI is yeah. down, your product doesn't work. Um, or maybe Stripe, if Stripe is down, your product doesn't work. Um, there's all of these third-party dependencies. Yeah. Um, and, and to your point, uh, to your question there on, on tools, you know, uh, this is actually a big part of, you know, why we started Alerty is uh, Alerty monitors everything that's part of your application. 
from websites to CDNs to uh, databases to some of those third-party vendors that actually are important to the business logic functioning properly. Um, the idea there is we want to give a, a simple platform that you tell it what you've got and we will go and monitor everything uh, for you and let you know when anything breaks or anything needs your attention. Awesome. So from my experience, I believe that it would be useful for you to actually do a demo <laughs> of Alasic so I can see how I can integrate that. So I was, my system was able to be down for five days because I have no maybe external monitoring setup and I didn't receive any alerts. That's really bad. <laughs> That's completely bad. And I'm going to, you know, want you to do a demo and we are going to get there. But for now, we still have one more question to go, right? So. The, the question that I have is how does observability scale with infrastructure complexity? So previously we talked about how it's now becoming complex to deploy systems. Now talking about um, building multiple like microservices, right? Where we have different servers connecting together and serving different regions and all of that. So that gives us a new level of complexity. So how does observability scale within you know this um, infrastructure complexity. Yeah, well, um, the I think the answer is they are very, very correlated. Um, I think that as your infrastructure gets more and more complex, so too does your observability have to get more complex. Um, an easy example of why this is true is if you're a solo dev or a small company or you don't have a lot of usage, you can imagine that you're just deploying to maybe one server, right? You've got a server, users hit it, it's simple, all works. As you get bigger and you have more and more infrastructure, maybe now you need multiple servers and mm -hmm. you have to route traffic between all of them and put a load balancer in front of it. You didn't just add more servers, which is kind of like a you know linear increase in, in how, many, how much data you have to ingest. You also added mm -hmm. a new piece of the system, the load balancer. You have to not just monitor your servers, monitor your load balancer. Say you get yeah. even bigger, you've got your servers, you've got your load balancer, you throw a CDN in front too. Okay, there's even more pieces to, to, to monitor. Over on the other side, you've got a database. You're running one replica. Well, that's that's not big enough now. You need you need two of them. You need to have a cluster so you can do failover and do upgrades. Okay, great. Uh, you, you continue to scale, you continue to scale. Now you need a task queue. The task queue has, has three pieces to it. There's an ingest server, there's a processing server, and there's a reporting server. Well, shoot, now you've got a, a CDN, you've got a load balancer, maybe multiple load balancers, you've got multiple servers, you've got multiple databases, mm -hmm. and you've got this whole task queue system. And that's just your first million users. If you're gonna go further than that, you're gonna have more and more and more pieces. And if any of them break, your whole system is down. You've gone from yeah. one or two little pieces to sprawling complexity, which is good. It's how you scale, it's it's needed. You need to be able to you know engineer to that degree, but it also means you have lots more points of failures. And if you, you need to have visibility and observability on all those things to know when something breaks, how do you go and diagnose at the right part? If your CDN breaks, you don't want to go spend time messing around with your database configuration. It's a waste of time and it's not going to fix your problem. So that's really where yeah. observability becomes extremely important as you get more and more complex and you scale. Awesome. So Johnny, like there's, there are lots of questions I would love to ask you, <laughs> like plenty of them, right? But for now, I'm going to still ask you, but I, I would want you to just give us like a one minute breakdown around all these questions. But for now, what is more important is I want you to do a demo of Alati for us, since I noticed that he's using AI to kind of, you know, do the monitoring and observability. So. I would like a demo of the platform. Maybe I can integrate it on content so that I don't have to um, <laughs> waste for five days before discovering that something is down, right? Yeah, happy to do so. Um, and I think exactly what you just described is a is a perfect case for it. You know, of uh, how do you make sure your thing isn't down for for multiple days? Um, let me uh, let me share a tab here real quick, and I'll show you what Alerty looks like. Um, this is the uh, this is the Alerty platform. I hope you can see my screen now. This is basically we're currently in the inventory, which allows you to see all of the resources that are being monitored and being observed right now, and the status of them. So you can see we've got a number of different websites here. Many of them are healthy. A couple of them have a couple issues, um, but we can see 
the status of all the things I care about. So if you were, you know, a, a, a new user coming in here, you would go and say, Hey, I have a new URL. Um, here's my website, uh, that I, that I just built. I want to make sure that it's up and what is, what Alerty is going to do here is if you tell it, this is the URL, we're actually going to create multiple different monitors. We're going to create three different monitors to tell you different things about the status of your system. We're going to tell you if it's up, but we're also going to tell you how fast is it to load your database, your, your, your site from a uh, system perspective, as well as load time, which is how fast until your users can actually see something on the site. If I click create three monitors here, you see, you'll see, we're going to start tracking these things. We're going to start checking them. It takes a few seconds, but what you'll see in few, momentarily is something like this, where I can see, all right, every 10 minutes, my load time is being checked. I can click into that. I can see mm -hmm. my load time looks to be about 1300 milliseconds recently. Um, that's all right. Over the last day, I can go and see the latency much lower. It's pretty fast to get about 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds to get data to uh, the end user. Um, and on the uptime side, it's been up really solidly over the last recent period of time. So instantly I'm getting all this information and if anything were to break, I would get a notification about it to my email. So I think that's a, that's the start of it. Though I will mention, this is just for websites, which is some of that external monitoring. It's really important yeah. to have all of your resources captured, right? So if you've got a CDN linking that in, it will tell you if there's anomalous traffic. If you're building an XJS, React, Node, or Vue, bring that in and show that, for example, this new React app, healthy, it hasn't had any crashes recently. That's great to know. The performance looks like it's all good. We don't have any anything too worrying. Um, I need to know that because if, if, if one of these things was breaking, how else would I know? Mm -hmm. I don't want to have that five days of downtime. Um, yeah. And then last piece here that I, I would call out is, you know, some of the databases, a uh, couple of different things. If you're a Supervase user, there's native support for Supervase where you simply provide your project URL and an API key. And we'll tell you things like, what's the CPU usage, memory usage. If I click into one of these, I can see that uh, recently, actually, there was some high CPU usage, a little bit too high. And so uh, an incident was created by Alerty where it told you, hey, uh, you might want to check this out. Looks like your, su your super based database usage was too high. That might cause some issues. So already the system is noticing things like that um, and telling you about them. Awesome. So the AI part, I see you have an assistant um, here. So, <laughs> so what does it do? Like, does it give me insight into um, what is monitoring? Yeah, that's exactly right. I think, um, you know, we talked earlier about internal tools and how important it is to have, or to, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants, use the tools that are out there. I think the assistant is basically a way of having your own monitoring expert uh, in your back pocket that can help you with things. So, um, I can ask it things like, what types of things should I uh, monitor for my databases? Um, and it will think about it and give me some some insights, all of which are you know already being captured if you were to add a database. But if you want to understand why, you can see things like uh, you know storage, CPU, performance. These are all critical things to know for um, monitoring a good database. Yeah, that is awesome because some person might not really know what to what is important, right? They just want to know their up, up time and downtime, but there are other critical things that they might want to monitor. Uh, this exactly. Is awesome. And you know, down Great. here you can see status pages as well. So if, for example, we were talking about OpenAI is down, you want to know about that, you can click in to see that here. Um, it's been fun. We added a bunch of these to an internal account, and I just you know keep an eye on it, but. GitHub uh, kind of has frequent incidents. There, it looks like 10 hours ago, there were quite a few incidents where they were having some issues. Um, I had no idea. If I didn't have something like Alerty, I wouldn't know that this was struggling so often. Okay, so one, one nice thing about this is that it sends you an email, <laughs> all right? It sends you an email whenever something is wrong. And at the same time, 
you can monitor specific things, right? Like I can monitor my database. So in my case, what was done was the API, honestly. It was just the API part of the system, okay? So I can easily just monitor that and also monitor the front end and also monitor the database, you know, all of these things in one platform. I can do all the monitorings and I get a lot. And most importantly, it is external. That means that my system doesn't, you know, cache anything that relates to my application. So it's, it's a great product. Um, nice one. So I didn't look at it this way, <laughs> but now I see a lot of use cases that um, we go on here. All right. Thank you very much, Johnny, for showing me um, Alati, and this is awesome. Okay, so like I said, I actually have a few other questions or maybe we could kind of set up another podcast so that uh, you discuss them. But it's basically related to your skill set as um, a software engineer. I noticed that you've been working, I think you said since you were 14. <laughs> that, that is awesome. <laughs> okay, so the question, the question that I, I, I would you know, personally love to know more about is you know, building better software, what does it take to build better software, right? And then another thing is, for somebody like you that has managed lots of servers, let's give it a number, 20 to 50, you know, what relevant, what is relevant to a backend engineer, right? That wants to be able to manage this kind of, this large number of servers. What are the relevant things that they should know, okay? And one important one is JavaScript monitoring. So, so far we've been talking about monitoring databases, monitoring our application, CI, CD and stuff. So can we monitor JavaScript? I know that JavaScript is a programming language. Can we monitor that? And if we can, how? Yeah. So, I mean, a, a couple of different pieces in there. Um, I think on the first one there, how do you make better software and how do you you know grow as a, as a developer? Honestly, yeah, I'll sound like a broken record here, but I think internal tools and, and automation is a really big way to actually uh, hone your craft. Um, and the reason I say that ties a little bit into my answer for how do you manage 20 to 50 servers. When you're managing 20 to 50 servers and getting that big, you actually aren't thinking about them individually, or at least you shouldn't. You shouldn't think about, I have server A, server B, server C, you're going to run out of the alphabet. Um, you want to think about, I've got 50 servers, that's one block. And one thing that's possible through automation is you write your configuration once, you write your rules once, you write your logic once, you run it, it spins up those servers or it does what it's supposed to do to those servers. Um, and if it's wrong, you don't go and fix it on the servers, you go and fix it in your logic. You wipe out what you did, you undo it, and you do it again through automation again. Because if you do it right, if you get your code right, if you get your automation right, 20 versus 50 versus 100 versus 500 isn't that big of a difference. It's about having really solid automation, really solid rules, really solid structures at the base. And that's, you know, what I call internal tooling. And so, you know, I think that approach of don't do things manually, do things through automation, um, write code, not configuration, uh, and, and, and write rules into software with version control and everything uh, allows you to you know, really make sure that the changes you're making are effective and, and scale as you get bigger and bigger um, quantities of servers to deal with. Awesome. So it is more, it is more on, you know, get your pipelines right. <laughs> Get right. your pipelines so, right, get your configuration right, get get your, your get your code right. If your pipeline is right, then managing large servers will be a problem. Alright? <laughs> so I get that. So talking about JavaScript monitoring, do you have anything around that? Yeah, so I think for JavaScript monitoring, um we talked about it a little bit earlier, but I think error monitoring is really important there of that's you know one of the one of the big things you can do in JavaScript. Um and looking at JavaScript SDKs that are natively integrated. Uh, external monitoring is great, but having your application actually report on its own health, its own status is really important too. So this is something that we we launched recently actually with Alerty is we launched a Next.js uh, SDK. It's two lines of code to integrate into your application and suddenly you get 
um, error monitoring and visibly into how is your JavaScript application performing uh, within the alerting platform. So if you have both that and the uptime monitoring, you've got a really good, really quick, easy sense of how is my service doing from a couple different angles. Awesome. So one last question, right? So I like Alasi. I'm going to try it out. So my big question is, is it free or does it have any plans for um, you know, payment and you know, kind of break that down for us? Um, let, let's, let me... Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Alert is completely free. Uh, we really want to make something that everyone can use and that developers can use. Um, and I think that charging for a dev tool is an easy way to make it inaccessible. <laughs> and so it's free to use. You're free to go try it out. Um, it's in it's an early version of it now. We have a lot that we want to add to it soon. So I think we're, we're still talking about it as a, as a beta product today. Um, but it's completely free to use and you're, you're welcome to go try it out. All right, thank you very much. So expect my accounts right away. <laughs> I look forward to it. Thank you very much, Johnny, for jumping in today. I actually learned a lot when it comes to, you know, building better software and actually managing large servers. So I learned that is, you know, the pipeline is always what you need to look into mostly. And there are a couple of things that I also learned from, you know, your experience as a software engineer and also, um, a good one at that. And for Alasi, it's also awesome because if I've known this before, <laughs> my server will be down for five days and that's really bad. So I'm going to kind of create an account and you know, sign up all my platforms. Thank you very much for jumping awesome. in. And yeah, guys. So guys, if you want to be alerted when your system is down and you want to also check other kind of threshold or other kind of metrics for your system, I think you should try out Alati. It's very, it's very awesome. I'm going to try it out and then I'm going to do a product review for you guys. Okay. So thank you very much for tuning in today. And see you guys in the next episode. Thank you.